afternoon and welcome to A Place Call Through. I am your host, Patricia Wade Goings, and we're broadcasting from WYTV7, Christian Broadcasters Network. WYTV7, Christian Broadcasters Network, is a nonprofit network where we share stories of real people with real stories, and we embrace and encourage and inspire others. And if you'd like to make a donation, we ask that you do so to help us keep our mission of hope going at WY. Today, we are blessed to have as our guest, Ms. Pandora Lambert. Welcome to A Place Called Through, Ms. Lambert. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lambert. Ms. Lambert is going to share with us her testimony, her story of how she has been on the other side of through. Uh, Ms. Lambert, if you yes. would, for our viewers and our listeners, just give us a little introduction about yourself, please, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Pandora Lambert, and I was born here in South Carolina. I was raised in New York. I moved back here when I was um, about 19 years old, back in 1978. And, um, well, I'm a re well, I'm not recovering. I'm a delivered addict. I was an addict at one time, but I thank God, you know, I'm now delivered. I um, started using drugs, actually, when I was in school, smoking weed. And then I was introduced to cocaine and pills and I, you know, popped pills for years and smoked weed. And then I was introduced to cocaine and um, I smoked cocaine for a long time. I got involved with um, some people that were doing, they call it free base cocaine, which is crack cocaine, they call it. And I was strung out for years. I, um, I, I, for about eight years, I have two children, two boys, and, um, God has really been good to me. I started using crack cocaine and I wound up in the system. I, I'm the, the, um, the place here, the, the jail here knew me by name. It was an in and out thing all the time. I was just, um, I, I got put on probation. That's how I started my 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 system with the um that's how I started with So you were incarcerated uh, while you were here in South Carolina. Yes. yes. When your incarceration time came at that time you were still Thank going you. through the addiction of crack cocaine, cocaine and other substance abuses? Yes, yes, yes. So you relocated from out to, to here. Yes, yes. But I was living here. Well, I while I'm while I'm here, I tell you, I tell you what. Can I just say, God has really did a thing in my life. I thank God. Without Him in my life, I don't know where I would have been. I used to smoke crack day and night. I mean, in and out. I was at ninety eight pounds wet at one time. I was smoking crack in the morning time, at night. You know, I just didn't have no stop to what I was doing. I got arrested and went to prison. Well, I was in jail for a long time. Then I went to prison. I stayed in prison for six months. And while I was there, I got a closer walk with, with God. I read the Bible. I ate the Bible. I slept the Bible. And um, I came home. When I came home, I did the same thing all over again. I relapsed and it became an ongoing thing. I was in in um, in, in, um, in and out of the, um, oh, thank you, Jesus. Um, not the, yeah, the rehab place I was in and out and counseling and all of this, but nothing did it for me, but God, I just want to tell you about my deliverance. Please, I went to that. a prayer retreat back in 2000, 2000. I went to Louisville, Kentucky, and I was in a prayer retreat. And the lady said, is anybody here want the um, Holy Ghost tonight? And I sat there for a while. And one of my cousins that took me, she said, get up there, girl, go now. So I went up and they were praying with me. One lady was in this ear and the other lady was over here. And they kept telling me, they said, can't you see God? Can't you just see him? You know, and at that time, I mean, I, I was messed up. I was messed up. And I, I began to close my eyes. She said, just call on Jesus. Just call Jesus. And I closed my eyes and I began saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus, and the more I called, the lady said, can't you see him? He bared that cross for you. 
They spit on him. They beat him. Can't you see the crown on his head and the blood running down? And the more I called Jesus, the more I saw these things. Amen. So I began to call Jesus. One lady said, shh, shh, just say, hallelujah, Jesus. I began to say, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. And the more I said that, I tell you, it just, the whole picture came brand new. And, and before you knew it, I was speaking in tongue. I was like, you know, I just began to speak in tongue. And I was just so happy and so pleased, you know, then I didn't want to stop. You know, that's when my deliverance came about. You know, I was delivered, totally delivered. I had a miraculous deliverance from crack cocaine. How many years were you addicted? How long was your addiction? About 12 years. 12 years. Amazing. My mom was my co-depender. You know, I had two children. Like I said, they were in school. I didn't know whether they ate. I didn't know whether they took baths. I didn't know any of this because I was so busy getting high, seeking whom I can devour for another hit. I thank God. You know, the whole time while I was out there, I can say that God was actually with me. And people used to, you know, why are you talking about God? I just felt that he was with me. Can I share this experience with you? I was out, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I was out um, one night on a binge. And I, I mean, I was out for about two days or so. And I came home. And when I came home, I had two rocks in my pocket. And I had the little thing that I was smoking on, which we call the crack pipe. It was homemade out of a little medicine bottle. It had aluminum foil on the top. And it was full of residue. So when I came home, I was like, I was just tired. I was wore out. I was beaten. I just wanted to go to bed. And it was just like Richard Pryor said, I put all of that stuff up. And when I laid down, I could hear it calling me, come on and smoke me. You know, you want this drug. Come on here and smoke me, girl. So I got up and I began to smoke the rock. I wanted to finish with it so fast. I just put the whole thing on top of the pipe and I pulled it through just to get the residue in the bottle. I got the bottle when I finished. And I scraped up all the residue. I cleaned the bottle out. We call it um, residue. I took all of the stuff and I put it on a saucer in the middle of my bed. And it was a nice day outside, a spring day. I took my curtain and I threw it up over the rod. And when I threw the curtain up over the rod, I turned to the sink to do something. And a strong wind out of nowhere just came in whoosh, and blew all of the stuff all over the place. And I was like, oh, my Lord, all my stuff is gone. You know, so I savaged what I could savage. I smoked it. And when I laid down to go to sleep, no, before I laid down, I passed by the mirror. And when I passed the mirror, I had to take a double look. Because I looked in the mirror, all I saw was my two eyes looking back at me. My hair, I I didn't have any hair. It was stringy, just stringy. My eyes were bulging out. They were big as marbles. My neck, you could take one hand and put around my entire neck. I didn't have anything. I mean, all up in here, my chest, all you could see was my ribs. And I looked and I was like, well, who in the world are you? I didn't even recognize who I was. So I laid down. And when I laid down on my bed, right beside me, I always kept a Bible by my bed. And I I picked up the Bible and I prayed. I said, Lord, wherever this Bible, wherever I stop in this page, please let it be something pertaining to my life. Lord, I need help. I need help. Because I'm tired of doing what I'm doing. So when I picked up the Bible and, 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 and I stopped on the page and it stopped in Psalms 57 and 13. But thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Mm. I said, look at this. This is me. You know, so I began to recite it until I memorized it. And that was... Uh, uh, that, that was an opening eye experience for me. I began to feel better about myself, but I continued to walk in, in, the, in the mess that I was in, but I felt like I had a cushion. I knew God was with me the whole time. Nobody could not tell me that I was not saved. Nobody could not tell me that I didn't have a relationship with God. Even though I was messed up, I was tied up, tangled up, and I was ugly and dirty, and, but I knew that God had me here for a reason. And that's the glory of God. No matter what shape you're in, he watches mm-hmm. over you. Mm-hmm. How did you going through this process in being addicted to crack cocaine? And you said that you had two children. What effects has that had on your family at that time? 
it it took it took a toll on my family. My children loved me through it. You know, at that time, they're eight years apart. I have two sons, and they're eight years apart. And at that time, I say my oldest son was about fourteen or fifteen, and my baby, he was maybe like about nine, you know, something like that, seven. And um, they loved me. They never saw me smoke crack. They knew that I was in the street. A lot of times my mom said, you out there smoking that crack, you know, and stuff like that in front of them. Um, but they never saw me with a pipe in my mouth or anything. I had respect for myself. I thank God for that. I never lost self-respect. I lost respect for, for, for other people and things and whatnot. But I always had a, a sense that, you know, I wanted to do better, but I couldn't. There was no, I just, anything I tried, I went to rehab, I went to counseling, I talked to the pastors, I talked to saved people, people prayed for me, and they, I just could not do any better. It was just like they, nothing helped me until I went to that prayer retreat, May 5th, 2000. You mentioned your mom as being your codependent. What, did she lose anything and by being your codependent? What was well, her. yeah, because she didn't have a life. You know, it was like I just stole her. Hey, glory to you, God. It was like I stole her life. She had to be there. She didn't have to, but I thank God for her. She was there with my kids. She saw that they ate. She saw that they were clothed. She saw that, you know, they went to school. She saw that they had um, activities, you know, in which I should have been there for them. But my mom was there. So she I would be out your, on with your children, ma'am. She took care of your children while you she were took still going through excellent your Excellent care of my children. Yeah. And I thank God because she never lost love for me. She used to tell me all the time when I come in, girl, look at you. You are one terrible sight. You look bad. You need to get yourself together. And my mom is a praying mom. I thank God for her. At that time, she was evangelist. Now she's Mother Stevens. But um, she would tell me, and I would look at her, hmm, I look good. I look in the mirror and I just knew I looked cute, you know. So I just kept on about my business, you know. But I finally saw what she saw when I took that look in the mirror and I looked and I said, oh, my God. So I actually got sick and tired of being tired of what I was doing. And it's going to take me to get there. And I, I didn't know then. I didn't know what to do. But your mom my was cousin, like, she was still... Even though she was your supplier, she was still coaching and praying you through it. Who is that? Your mom. Your mother. She, she, yeah, she, she was the codependent for my children, never my supplier. Okay. She was a co- yeah, codependent for my children. children. Instead of me being there, my mom was there. My mom is a, she's, I thank God for a prayer mother. You is know? your mom still and, living? Oh, yes. Yeah, she's 83 years old and she still has a reign on things. Thank God for her right mind. Yeah, she still drives and go fishing and do, do what she do. And I thank God now I'm a better daughter to my mother. I'm a better mother to my children. I'm a better person in society. So while you were going through this process of your addiction, where did you get the funds to support this habit? <laughs> that's, that's the strangest thing about it. It was like me being who I am, I really didn't need a lot of money because I was just a nice person. And I knew all of the drug dealers and most of the people that I knew had money. The people that were getting high had money. It was like they needed me because I knew how to cook powder into rock. It was like I was a walking pharmacist. The pocketbook that I used to carry on my shoulder had nothing in it but stuff too. It was like a laboratory in my pocketbook. So most of the time I got free hot. I had a friend one time, God bless him. He's dead now, but this man, and he, he was a true dealer. He would bring his stuff and have me help him cut it up and whatnot. And while I'm cutting up, I'm studying snorting. I'm snorting this coke snorting. And I tell him, I ain't high yet. I ain't high. I just can't get high. He said, well, you don't snort it up. Or he said, let me tell you when you're going to get high. He said, when you start paying for this yourself, then you start getting high. He said, but why are you getting everything free? You ain't not, you're not going to get high. And I found that to be a true statement because when I put my first $20 into buying some drugs, 
it was like, it lasts me a long time. And I felt good, you know, because I guess that was my money. And I didn't want to see it go up in smoke. So before you were actually able to pay for it, did any of the people that you were associated with ask you to supply anything or do anything because of the fact that you were at that time enjoying the party, as they say? Yeah, to ask me to. You mean as far as propositioning me or anything? Oh, no, no, no. I was always at home. You know, everybody knew me. Everybody knew me and they knew that I wasn't going to stand for selling my body and sleeping around and stuff like that. You know, um, I, pro- I was propositioned a lot of times, but it, it, it was to the point where I would tell them, you just keep that. If I have to do this in order to get that, you keep it, you know, and I thank God for that. You know, I never had to sell my body to get anything that I wanted. It was like, I, I, I have a gift for gab. And I could have talked, I could talk the drugs right out of their pockets, you know? Wow. <laughs> it's like I could just talk it out of their pockets. And the girls envied me. I never had any girlfriends because they would wonder why I would always be on the in crowd. Wherever the in crowd was, there I was. I was the life of the party. Well, how but did the you- other girls had to do whatever they did in order to get to, you know, drugs? How did you? managed to sell the drugs to other people? I wasn't a good seller. I, I was I was the best buyer. I was I used everything I had. I couldn't sell drugs. You didn't have anything I, left to sell because you used it? Right, right. They would, you know, some of the dealers would actually trust me to sell it, but they knew that I wasn't going to sell no drugs. I was going to smoke it. I was going to snort it, you know. So they, they really wasn't losing anything. And as a matter of fact, I think they actually wanted to just give it to me, you know. But it got to a point where I was just tired. I was sick and tired of being tired. I remember after coming from the prayer, the prayer retreat in 2000, and I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I came home, and that whole week, nobody, none of my old playmen, nobody knocked on my door. Nobody came to see me until the following week. I had a knock on the door and he said, Pansy, let me come in. You know, I got something. And I was so happy to tell him I'm saved. I'm born again in Christ. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I don't do that no more. Ah. He looked at me. He said, girl, get out of here. I said, no. I said, I'm a changed person. I said, God changed my life. And he was proud of me. He said, I'm so proud of you. Pray for me. And he left. Another guy came the next weekend. I told him the same thing. I'm born again in Christ. I'm saying I don't do that no more. He said, girl, get out of here. Let me use that bathroom. I'm coming in there to smoke my dope. And I'm like, you're not coming in my house. I said, I'm born again in Christ. And I don't do that. He said, you've been saved a long time. So move out the way, you know. And he didn't believe me. But I proved to him that I don't do that anymore. And I was just proud of myself. And in, in that saying, just say no, I was able to just say no because Christ had entered my life. Well, I while you it. were going through your addiction, um, you know, because drugs do cost money. So how much money do you think that you would say that you had invested during your drug addiction time? Well, I invested a lot of money, a lot of money. During my drug addiction time, maybe, I can't really put a number on it, thousands of dollars. And that money came from because you had you were working or I worked. You saved the money. I I couldn't save a dime, but I worked. You know, I would work. I worked pretty good. I even had a car. You know, but um, it didn't last long. Whatever I had never lasts long because of the addiction. So what you because had it was in trade for the drug addiction, right? Everything so, I had went. Every dime I made went towards, you know, getting high. So now that we've, you, you've been incarcerated, you're free of this addiction, God has delivered you from that to the other side of through you are now. You're finished with that part. Of, that's a chapter that's already been written and now closed and you're moving on to greater things. So yes. tell us, where are you working and what are you doing now? What is, what's in the future for you? Well, um, in the future for me, um, Right now, I'm I'm disabled, but I I'm writing a book. 
I'm writing a book, and the funny thing about it is the title. The God gave me a title for my book a long time ago. God told me to write my testimony while I was in prison. I want to share this with you if I have time. Yes, I was in prison, and this was this was like um, a week before my release. I did six months in the woman's prison in Columbia, South Carolina. I did six months, and the four months I did six, I was on work release. So I worked the entire time I was there, like. But I was in the bed and I was laying there and I was, you know how you sleep and you don't sleep. Yeah. And I heard a voice say, um, find new ground. And I was like, <laughs> and I turned over and a little strong said, find new ground. And I said, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, I laid back, you know, I was just laying there. I heard it again, say, find new ground. And I was like, oh God. Okay. All right. I hear you. So I jumped up and I ran out in the hallway and I called my mom. I said, mom, I just had an experience from the Lord. And he told me something. And I don't remember what he said. And she said, well, don't worry about it. Because when the time comes for you to do it, you will. He'll bring it back to your memory. So I said, oh, okay. So it took a few months. I was released. I went home about 90 days in. I was doing good. I relapsed again. Felt so bad. I went to my auntie's house and I told her that I relapsed. She said, dust yourself off, girl, and just don't do that no more. Get away from these people, this, that, and the other. And while we were talking, it came back. And I, I said, oh, I remember. The Lord told me to find new ground, you know, and I was so excited about it. And shortly after that, I did. I moved from where I was, and I went to another um, dwelling. And while I was there, I began to defrag, you know, things. I began to smoke less. I began to not be around the people that I was around and things like that. And that's when I went to the prayer retreat in 2000. Well, we look like we're going to have to wrap up. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. But what would be your words of encouragement or inspiration to someone else who may be at the station where you were? And if you wanted to help them break free of this addiction, what would be your words of encouragement that you would impart to them? I would say God can. God has, God will. He has everything we need. We just need to learn to trust, lean and depend on him with everything that we have. Like I said, I've been to a prison. I've been um, in rehab and I've talked to counselors. I've talked to a whole bunch of different people and tried a whole lot of different things. But it wasn't until I tried Jesus for myself I would have people tell me all the time, you need to, you need to, you need to. But we're not going to do it until we ourselves know that we have, we're just tired. You have to get sick and tired of being tired. I tell the people that have loved ones that are out there, that are strung out on drugs and, and going through, don't shun them. Don't, you know, make them feel any worse than they already are. Because nine times out of 10, they don't even want to be where they're at. They just don't know how to come to Jesus. They don't know how to, to, to just let it go and let God, you know? So the more we encourage them, don't give them no money. Give them love. Give them food. Give Amen. them shoes. Give them what they need. My mother kept me looking good. Whenever I wanted to go to church, she would make sure I looked good enough to go to church, okay? My mother, she was behind me 100%, and I just thank God for her totally. So love those people that are out there that don't know how to come. And there's a word that says love covers a multitude. How yes. many years have you been clean from this addiction? Ma'am? How many years have you been clean of this addiction? Mm. May 5th, 2000. So every year is another year to me. This is 20, May 5th, 20, 20. It'll be 20 years. Amen. That's wonderful. Thank God 20 for years. your deliverance. And the best thing about it is I had a miraculous deliverance. Before I left to go on the prayer retreat, I had a half a pack of cigarettes. I had took all my drug paraphernalia, put it in a bag, and I threw it in the woods. I said, I don't need you anymore. When I come back, I'm going to be a different person. So I had a half a pack of cigarettes. I said, well, I might need these. So I left those on my, on my dresser. I said, when I come back, I might, you know, smoke a cigarette or two. At least I won't be doing no drugs. When I came back, the cigarettes were up there. And I went to grab them. And the first thing that came to my mind was touch not, handle not the unclean thing. <laughs> I picked them up and I crumbled them up and I threw them away. I said, I don't need you either. So I had a miraculous deliver. I was delivered from smoking. I was delivered from club hopping. 
I was delivered from uh, drinking and just hanging out in the street. I just thank God. Well, 20 we years, God is doing a new thing in my life. Amen. And we want to certainly thank you for sharing your testimony of your deliverance and your healing and prayerfully that it will help someone else. And to our listeners and to our viewers, if you have an addiction, we encourage you to please seek professional help. Also, keep yourself in prayer. Read the scripture daily. Again, we want to say thank you to you, Ms. Lampert, for being our guest on A Place Called Through. And to our viewers and to our listeners, if you have a testimony, you want to share your story on A Place Called Through, please do so by contacting me, your host, Patricia Wade Goings, at pgoingswp at gmail.com or area code 843-608-9744. Reminder, if you'd like to make your charitable donation, you may do so at WYTV7, christianbroadcasters.org. Again, today we thank Ms. Lamper for being our guest and sharing the other side of through. God bless you and continue success. Thank you. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Our pleasure. Amen.